Welcome back to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. My name is Wayne Kimmel, managing partner of 76 Capital, the sports tech venture capital company. On this show, I interview top sports entrepreneurs, athletes, and executives who are truly shaping and many times changing the overall sports business industry. Today, we're going to talk about the gaming industry with Contessa Brewer, who covers casinos and gaming for CNBC. Contessa, welcome to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. Thank you, Wayne. You know, this is an about face because normally I would be interviewing you. Like, I think this is the first time a venture capitalist has ever interviewed me. Well, I'm excited to do that. And, I, and we love flipping the mic. I mean, one of the, my, my favorite interviews, and, and I think you could be, you, you, we'll see how it all works out. But one of my favorite interviews was with Brent Musburger. And to flip the mic on him was really exciting to hear all the insights and all the things that he's done in his career. And that's what we want to do with you here. Well, you've you just know, turned down the gauntlet. So now I, now I really have to perform. I got to bring it if I'm going to even compete with Brent. Well, I'm sure I'm sure you'll do a great job and, and you always do. And, you know, it's amazing. I mean, you started your career back in 2003 on the national scene at MSNBC with your own show covering storms and catastrophes all over the country um, and then, you know, shifting over to CNBC. And that's what really we want to talk about today. And, you know, it's just amazing. You, you, you cover the casino industry and now what's happening with the sports betting and eye gaming. You know, what's that been like seeing this shift now from the casino world where you were talking to sort of the major CEOs to now here's sports betting and how that's come into the into the mix? You know, it's really incredible because in 2017, when CNBC asked me to cover gaming, they said, listen, there's really only four companies you have to worry about. You need to watch Las Vegas Sands, Wynn Resorts, MGM and Caesars. And, and that's really it. And uh, I, I mean, my first job out of school was in Reno, Nevada. So I had had very early exposure to casinos and to really the day-to-day -day environment of a casino. So it was something I was familiar with. And and quite early on, I realized, no, there's there's more going on than just in those four big global giants. But then the Supreme Court overturned PASPA and it's like the wild west right this is this is everybody is like way hey, i heard there's gold and then there are hills and everyone's rushing to stake a claim and what it's done is it's created incredible opportunity incredible growth and potential for growth and potential for scams and potential for um uh, uh speculation potential for um, a, a big investment and a huge destruction of capital. And so it's a really exciting time to be covering gaming. It's probably the most exciting time to be a business journalist covering casinos and gambling. Um, so it's been a lot of fun and also a real education, right? Because as you mentioned, I came from general news. I had a business show uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010, it, you know, after the big financial recession. And so it's not that I was unfamiliar with business and money and the workings of and the importance of um, business in a capital society, but to cover it to this degree, I mean, to learn the definition of EBITDA um, has been important and, um, and illuminating. Well, I mean, look, I think we both will, will agree, you know, this analogy that I use a lot is that this is what happened in the late 90s and early 2000s with the Internet is what we see that's happening right now with the gaming industry, with the advent of with sports betting across now all across North America. Uh, we really see what's happening. And it's interesting, you know, you know, is that something that you would do you agree with that? I mean, is that something that you really you sort of see that that's that's how this this kind of is playing out right now? Yeah, I mean, whenever you see the speculation and the rush to new advances, new technology, as you mentioned in the dot-com era, and we saw um, the massive growth and then the spectacular bust that came of that bubble. We saw the same thing with housing in 2008 and 2009 with the mortgage crisis. Um, I am watching cryptocurrencies in much the same way. I mean, we saw just over the weekend, $200 billion wiped off of, um, of the crypto market. 
there's a lot of growing pains that go along with a new industry expanding so rapidly. And that's what we're seeing right now, not just in sports betting, but in, in digital online gambling too. I mean, for my audience on CNBC, I always explain iGaming and what it is, but I'm, I'm sure that the folks who watch this podcast know that already. But I think that that's a, a huge driver, a huge potential driver of growth. And it's remarkable that uh, it's not being capitalized in the same way as sports betting. The, the rush to embrace sports betting has been much quicker than the rush to embrace iGaming. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a great point with over 30 states now, close to 35 states, right, that have legalized sports um, betting, but iGaming is still only five states. Right. So or, may, or maybe or maybe six at this point. But but at any rate, the, the whole issue is if legislators are looking at sports gambling as a way to increase state tax revenue, then I'm, I'm so baffled by why they haven't embraced online digital gaming in the same way. Um, you know, New Jersey, which is the most mature state on that front, is really seeing the benefit of embracing the whole spectrum of expanded access to gambling and what that what that does. We said earlier, you, you know, when you first you were sort of told to, to kind of look at the, the big four, you know, casino companies, and, and that would include you know, talking with like Rob Goldstein at Las Vegas Sands, Tom Reeg at, at Caesars, you know, and, and with on the sports betting side, guys like Joe Asher, who was formerly of William Hill, and, you know, then, you know, Amy Howe at, at FanDuel and, and Jason Robbins at DraftKings. I mean, what has it been like for you to develop relationships with all these different individuals, such, in, you know, such all have different personalities, different kind of wants and 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 what they really believe is is going to be the next next thing what has it been like you know for you to get to know all of them uh important i mean it's really it's really crucial to what i do and especially given cnbc's impeccable brand in business news um i could not do my job without the willingness of ceos to sit and talk with me but i will tell you the CEOs of publicly traded companies are careful and they're careful even in private conversations uh, because they are highly regulated. Their investors are counting on them that, they, you know, th there's just a much more, I think the, the burden of responsibility in terms of the way you communicate falls more heavily on those CEOs. Um, Derek Stevens has been incredibly candid with me and much, you know, now he doesn't have to tell me anything about how much money he makes or, you know, where, where Las Vegas is going, but I find him, he's, he's the um, owner of Circa and a bunch of other Las Vegas casinos. He really is doing gambling in a, in a way that we saw gambling done. Well, not we, you, not you and I, cause we weren't that old, but you know, he's sort of like, the old fashioned visionary for what gambling in Las Vegas can and should be. And he's, he's plotting his own course and he's not beholden to shareholders who want to see every quarter that there's growth and what's the return on capital. And, and, and you know, how am I going to make money investing in your company? And that gives him, I think more Liberty, to just do what his gut is telling him to do. And, and the way he's communicating that is really clear. Now, I, I sat with, um, I did an interview with Amy Howe yesterday um, as part of a story that I'm going to do about the, the problem of offshore unregulated gambling sites. Um, it really provides incredible competition to the legal regulated sites who are deploying all of this investment in marketing and promotion and customer acquisition, they, they have an unfair playing field when it comes to guys like Bavada who don't aren't paying state and local taxes, who aren't getting regulated. They don't have to pay the government relations fees and the lobbying fees and the, um, the, the effort to apply for a license in any states. And because they were operating before PASPA was overturned, they already have a core group, a loyal group of customers who may not have 
switched over to regulated gam you know, gambling sites now. So I was talking to her about that and you know, she's really outspoken and she's not the only CEO who has told me it's one of the big, the biggest headwinds right now in 2022, where we're sitting, Wayne, it's one of the biggest challenges to a path to profitability. And, you know, I keep talking about this on CNBC and you and I have talked about this before, this shift in investor sentiment where everybody was looking for that incredible growth. And now they just expect you to name the date and time when you can break even. Like where, where, where does that come in your digital advance? And, um, and so to, to satisfy that, they really think that they need more enforcement um, against illegal gambling. Well, I think one of the the great things that you've done, um, and it certainly it, it was it was great for us as well. I remember at G two E this past year, uh, you, you interviewed Matt Holt, who is the CEO of our portfolio company U.S. Integrity, uh, mm -hmm. who is, you know, part of part of that that push and that movement to make you know try to make sure that all sports betting in the United States and in North America, and quite frankly across the world, is regulated and is done all above board. So that we can have those types of those types of opportunities. Do you think, though? And one of the interesting things you're that already flipping it on me, Contessa. I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> but but look, one of the interesting things about this um, whole move to try and convince people not to go to the offshore sites is, and you know, I've been told this in private conversations, the question of liberty and freedom and how much Americans really value making their own decisions for themselves. So for instance, I was told, look, we could put up firewalls that prevent people from going to these sites. China does it, you know, in, in China, there's no gambling on uh, illegal, unregulated offshore sites. Why? Because the Chinese government knows how to block that. But we live in a free country. So what, what you see is like the interruption of um, a domain name or a destination site and, and the offshore sites make a game out of guess what our next domain name is going to be. And, and so it makes it easy for customers to keep following them. Do you think that the whole fierce individualism that Americans have applies to gambling in unregulated sites too? I, I think part of it is, is really that people are looking for the best, you know, the best number. And, and that's, that's what I think is the, is the opportunity. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, someone like a Derek Stevens, someone like, you know, Michael Gaughan from the South Point and, and some of these um, operators who are, are not public, right? And many of which who, who are some of the, I'd call them some of the entrepreneurs or cowboys of, of the industry. Um, they're the ones who, you know, a lot of times, one of the reasons why they're they're making some of the progress they're making. I mean, Contessa, I got to ask you, you know, we, we were in, it was a, I think it was a Sunday before one of the big events in Las Vegas, and we were at the, at Circa in their three-story sports book. I mean, have you seen anything like that anywhere else across the country or anyone else build something that's so incredible <laughs> in, the, in that world? No, I, well, I mean, I, I, I couch that by saying in all the years of me going to Las Vegas for fun or going to casinos for fun, not to cover them. <clears throat> but I really didn't make a habit of going to sports book. That was not like, that wasn't really my scene. The pool at the hard rock was my scene, Wayne. You remember, I know you remember. The, the interesting thing was the diversity of the crowd, meaning, you know, like I could see a lot of different demographics coming into play in that sports book. And the fact that, what was that? That was a, it was a football weekend when we were there. It was packed, it was packed. And also I was surprised by how many people still smoke. Cause I don't see that that much anymore. Like the, in that, in that particular setting, I was like, wow, people still do smoke. Um, and, and when Derek was opening up Circa, he was very proud of the kind of HVAC system he was putting in there where, you know, all the cooling comes through the floor and everything goes up through the ceiling vents. And, um, he, he was, that was something that he thought about. So, you know, it, it was an impressive scene and the enthusiasm. This is the other thing. 
you're not going to get that on a phone, right? You, that kind of energy, people had their phones out and they were, they, you know, they may have been making bets on their phones, but they're all together in this place where you're part of a crowd and you're cheering on the team. And that, that energy is something that we miss during the pandemic and we highly value now that we can be back in the same spaces again. Right. And, and I also saw you cover on CNBC the story of the um, the sports book that's now open at you know, the first sports book that was attached to an arena that Ted Leonsis and Monumental did mm -hmm. um, now originally with William Hill. Now with now it's Caesars. And, you know, that's now happened, you know, across a number of different states, a number of different teams now have sports books attached to their arenas and stadiums. And now even here in Pennsylvania, you have a sports book inside of a sports bar at Chickies and Pete's with parks being the casino uh, right. inside. So this retail move of, of sports books and, and casinos, what, what are your, what are your thoughts around well, kind of the move into the mainstream now? I, th I think that, I think it just increases engagement. I think in all ways, who wins at this is everybody in terms of um, the bars, get people to sit there longer and order food and drinks more. The sports teams get more active, more avid fan engagement and likely sell more jerseys and more hats. And um, the the content providers, you know, the, the TV networks get avid fans who are paying attention to the game and watching the advertising and, and make a better return on the investment that these networks have made on sports. Um, I think the the advertising around sports betting has made betting seem a little less sinful. You know, that, that old idea that if you're gambling, it's a vice. Um, I think, you know, it's sort of like having beer advertisement. Nobody thinks somebody who goes and grabs a beer is engaging in um, necessarily an alcoholic behavior because having a beer at the game or having a beer with friends is now commonplace and, and you know, sort of just nothing that we have to think about. Although on the other hand, back to smoking, you notice how the public stand against smoking, making it illegal to do it in bars and restaurants has made smoking more sinful. Like the feeling of it is more sinful than it used to be when every movie and every TV show showed actors smoking, that we've kind of gone the other way with that as a vice. And it, so you can just see what having it in your face does for the perception of whether it's good or bad, whether it's acceptable and normal or whether it's somehow undercutting society. And I think as we see gambling spreading so much, there are lessons to be learned from Europe. And I don't think it's being taken seriously here. I don't think the regulators are watching it. I don't think that the companies, they pay it lip service, but I'm not sure that people are watching what's happened in Europe and the backlash against the pervasive availability of gambling and the ever present marketing they're not using it as a morality tale to apply here in the United States. Meaning in Europe, uh, t take the UK for instance, you know, they're now limiting how much you can gamble, how much you can lose, when you can advertise. And it's, and it's hurting the bottom line of the companies that have invested in sports gambling because there's they let it go so big and so widespread that the regulators have really cracked down in ways that you know, nobody would nobody would support at this point in the United States. But I think it's the onus is on the companies because the regulators haven't done it. The onus is on the companies to restrain themselves. And then the question becomes, if you restrain yourself as a publicly traded company because you don't want the backlash, are up, up and comers going to take advantage of your restraint and come in and just splash themselves all over stadiums and jerseys and and college advertising, you know, that that question about encouraging underage gamblers, I think, is likely to become become a topic that we're hearing more and more. You know, one of the things that has been really interesting to see is the is this 
complete convergence between the world of sports and betting, right? Because of because sports betting, because of PASPA is now legal in, in all these states across the U.S. And one of the things that we've seen, and I want to get your take on this, is just the the Ted Leonsis of the world, the, the owners of, of sports teams, the executives in, in the world of in this world of sports, the commissioners that were once totally against the world of betting, now they're embracing it wholly. And it's like an amazing new category, a new way, new revenue sources, right? Have you have you had an opportunity to spend some time with team owners or commissioners and kind of gotten their their thought like wow like i can't believe we're here or have they got given you any sort of insight into what they're they've been thinking about this you know it's so funny because i really feel like um batman the commissioner of of um the nhl nhl right I, was he was the first to come out and just wholeheartedly throw himself into it all the rest of these guys if they were politicians, they'd get accused of being flip floppers and somebody would run an ad against them. You know, back now I'm thinking about um, Al Gore and, 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 oh, and Mitt Romney, you know, like just the advertising that would come back. You weren't allowed to change your mind. I'm not really sure why they were ever again. I don't really understand. I get the integrity part of it. And I get, you know, we've seen this both from the NFL and from the NBA that the integrity of the sport is really important to them. They understand the value of the brand and for people to believe that the games aren't fixed. So, so that was first and foremost. But, but I think the money-making potential of it and the revenue part of it, it overcomes so many other qualms and you know how, how you work it out. So it's not surprising to me that they've done that. And I think now they're just, they're not focused anymore on what their stand was. It's all now about how to own the biggest portion of the pie. And we've seen that with the NFL, right? That, you know, they're making deals, but when they made a deal with both DraftKings and Caesars, I was like, well, I, I don't really get it. Like they're, so you're both going to be partners. Like what's, how is that good for you? They're like, it's the NFL having any piece of the pie is better than having no piece of the pie. And so you do a deal where you're partners with your mortal enemy rather than get left behind. Um, and who wins in that is for sure the NFL. Um, and the same thing, we're seeing the same thing with the data providers that, you know, the data providers got, got into the same type of bidding war that the networks have been in with the NFL and you know, you have to be pretty sure that you're going to get a return on that, that massive investment. And so, you know, we saw Sport Radar walk away from the NFL. Um, and my sense is that they don't regret it. They think that they made the right decision at the right time, considering how much was at stake and considering that how widely available NFL data is, even if it's not proprietary. Does that make sense? It makes a ton of sense. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Radar and Genius and, and how that all plays out and the amount of money that Genius you know put up to, to be the data provider for the NFL. I mean, it's just, it was, these were staggering numbers and, you know, we'll see if that, that plays out to be, you know, that, that the, the right thing, but the NFL is the NFL. And I think that was their, that was their idea. So um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, what, you know, is, have you had, a situation where you've actually been with and then sitting with a, a CEO of a company. And as you said earlier, kind of the flip flops, or they're kind of just telling you a bold face lie. I mean, it could be in sports, it could have been anything you've done. And you're like, and you just call them. Have you ever called someone out on that? Have you ever? Yeah, I did it. I, I, I won't say who it was. You know, some of these conversations that I have, um, they're on background. So the deal that I make with people is I won't attribute this to you. Uh, and so people will talk to me more freely, but I literally had the head of a casino tell me yesterday, uh, tell me recently um, a sob story about how tough it is for casinos. Like that, like it's just been such a hard time in the pandemic. And I was like, I, I literally said, who do you think you're talking to? I cover gaming. I cover every earnings quarter. 
Gaming has never been in the money-making business the way it is now. We have never seen a period ever. We are seeing record-breaking revenue, record-breaking earnings. We, we, have, we have seen an incredible boom in gambling. So who are you trying to play off like, oh, it's so difficult for us. And yes, the casinos closed down during the pandemic. Yes, it was dicey. Yes, people got laid off. That is all true. Two years ago, we have the, the recovery has probably been among the best of any industry in the United States. <laughs> and it just, I mean, I don't pretend to be the expert on everything. I cut, as you know, I cover a lot of things and I'm not, um, I cover it for CNBC where I have a general business audience. So a lot of things I don't get too in the weeds. I, you know, I'm not, I try not to be too, too detailed that I'm losing interest from people who don't know gaming inside and out the way you do and, and the way your audience does. But I was just incredulous that somebody would try to pawn that off on me of all people. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing to hear. I mean, but but that's I mean, I think one of the things that you know you've you had you've had this this amazing talent, right? You have this amazing talent to be able to sit down with people and and really have them sometimes share things maybe they don't want to share um, with you. Have, have you had a situation with that where you you kind of <laughs> were going down the path with someone and they're like, and you're like, oh my god, I can't believe they just told me that. Yeah. Well. Uh, last year, you and I were both at a sports betting conference, and um, I was in a, in a conversation with uh, an analyst, Barry Jonas, and um, Sue Kim, and the topic of the Oakland A's moving to Las Vegas came up, and Sue Kim had, like, an interesting side comment. Now, again, I'm not in this to, like, crucify anybody. But you can imagine how much my ears perked up to hear that a publicly traded company that owns a piece of property in Las Vegas might be in the running to host the Oakland A's, who, by the way, have not made a decision or announcement that they're going to move to Las Vegas. Yeah, I'm like that was not an intentional thing. There was no press release. They were not intending to make a, a point out of that. But because I'm nosy and, uh, you know, I'm like... I'm half, you know, I'm half paying attention to the room. I'm half listening to this conversation. And as soon as I hear that, I perk up. I'm like, what was that again? Can you just, wh where do we? So part of that, Barry gets the credit because, you know, he had popped the question in. I j and I only get the credit because I have a TV platform and was able to turn it around and, and go take it. But by the way, on that front, that was uh, December? Uh, no, I don't remember when that was. Sometime last year, we were at that conference. Now, there's still no, there's still no firm move beyond then. So it was just something tantalizing. It was more like, I guess, looking back on that, maybe it was more gossip than anything else. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the analysts. We've had a couple of them on on our show here our, on our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. And again, Contessa, it's amazing having you on our show. We have Contessa Brewer from CNBC. You got to follow Contessa at Contessa Brewer on Twitter. Great follow and just someone that really understands the industry is, and, and someone, as you can tell from this, this conversation, is really has developed incredible relationships with all the movers and shakers across the casino and sports betting industry. And so, you know, as I was saying before, like with the, with the, um, the different analysts, I mean, do you get, do they spend time talking with you, kind of giving you in their insights a little more maybe than they even, their, their, their writing? Um, how do you, how's that part of your overall reporting yeah, they they do, um, and that's one of those situations where they have to be very careful about what gets used on the record where their name is associated because um, of the rules regarding how they publish notes and um, I, you know there, there's a lot of minutia that goes into that. But the analysts, I feel like the analysts could be great betting journalists, gaming journalists because they know they often they know more than I know. I mean, you typically, I would say the analysts have a have a really good sense of what's going on in the industry. Their grasp of the trends is is fantastic. 
they have great access and great relationships as well. If you're going to be a good analyst, it's just like being a good journalist. You have to have all that and you have to have people who are willing to, to talk to you because on those earnings calls, when CEOs are on the record and the CFOs chime in, it's all, you know, most of it is pre-planned. Most of it is carefully legaled and lawyered and, you know, guided by teams of people. And so authenticity and candor can sometimes get left behind. And that's why, you know, the when I go to do an in-person interview, a sit-down interview, I get so much more out of it because yes, there's the interview on camera, but there's also the chit chat that happens before we sit down and the chit chat that happens afterwards. And that's where people sometimes loosen up and give you a much clearer picture than they will when the camera comes on and the lights are on and they feel like, you know, what they say comes with responsibility. That's so interesting. And I mean, it's, it's one of the things I think a lot of people are now talking about with this the Zoom world that we live in when we do these types of interviews like this, where we're we're not sitting in the same room. I mean, there must be so much, whether it's body language or other types of you know, things that are kind of happening around, or maybe you see you're in a CEO's office and you see a certain book or picture or something that makes you say, hey, I want to ask you about that. I mean, has those types of things happen when you do these interviews? Yeah, I, I think I think more of it is that the it's still about energy, right? We were talking about that, about being at the sports book gambling versus in your living room gambling. There is an energy among people when you connect with them and you trust them and they believe you and they, you know, you, th there's a camaraderie that develops. And I hope, I, and I think that the CEOs that I've established relationships with, um, I've gained their trust in that they know that I'm I'm definitely not out to nail them to the wall. I was a cable news anchor on MSNBC for many, many years. And I, I never had a beat other than, you know, I covered a lot of politics as you might imagine. But when people came on my show, it could sometimes be adversarial and me pointing out flaws in their argument or um, a total uh, flip flop on what they where they said they stood and what their actions show, and <clears throat> I, I was worried when I started doing this that that uh, my reputation as a cable news anchor might follow me into business news, and and maybe it did to a degree, um, but at the same time, the the thing that CNBC gives me is this really weird intersection. This and it can be full of friction where I need access to the companies, but I also am still responsible for investigation, right? So I have to hold them accountable. I have to ask tough questions. I have to press them when I don't think they're being fully um, candid or honest, or if, you know, if everybody's gloss, let's take inflation, for instance. You know, it's been a big question of mine about whether rising gas prices, food prices, housing prices starts cutting into the profits that casinos are making. And universally, you heard this on all the earnings calls. No, we are not seeing that yet. A couple of the CEOs said on earnings calls, we're only seeing it at the very lowest demographic of customer, meaning those that they don't make much money on anyway are starting to pull back their spending. They Maybe they don't drive to Las Vegas anymore to gamble. Um, or if they come in, they're not eating out, they're eating in their rooms rather than, than you know, eating at the hotel restaurants. It's my job to press them on, well, how long does it take to move into the mass portion of your gaming client? At, like, when do you start seeing gaming revenues pulling back? Um, and, and that intersection between access, meaning I want good relationships with the CEOs, but I also have to hold their feet to the fire is something that I have not really encountered until this job at CNBC. I did not have that at, at MSNBC and at, in local news for sure. Um, I could just drive away at tough questions the way I wanted to without regard for, are you going to like me on the other side of this? You know, you mentioned earlier about, you know, talking to people 
off the record or having kind of background work? I mean, how do you develop those relationships and sort of those confidential sources that that people are always wondering about? And I, 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 and I heard this information from someone, or and I and I want to share this, but like, how do you do that as as a reporter? I mean, is that something that's been? Um, it, it's, it seems like you're you're very good at doing that. I almost never offer to go off the record ever because it's not in my interest. Like my interest is in reporting the information. It's all well and good for me to know something, but if I can't tell my viewers what I know, um, it's it, it that that's a challenge. But sometimes people won't tell me what I need to know unless I will go off the record. And to me, off the record means I can't report it unless I find another source for the same information. So that's, you know, that's really important to the way I do my job. Um, and I, and I, when I say to someone that it's off the record, I mean it, I keep my promises. I don't reveal my sources. Um, but I will, if they tell me something that needs to be reported, I will do my damnedest to find other sources of the information. Although there was, a, there was, I kept getting a story off the record. Nobody wanted their names attached to it. And it's about somebody in, in this industry, in your, in your industry, a very famous, knowledgeable character who the story went did something illegal in sports betting and something that could get the company in big trouble, get him in big trouble. And I heard it from multiple sources. The problem was I could never find any evidence of it. There was no, for sh there was no smoking gun. Now there was a case where if you won't, if you won't put your name to it and I can't independently verify it, it's too, it's too dangerous and, and potentially wrong for me to go with that information. And so I just, I never did anything with the story because I couldn't, I could not find verification for it, but it was juicy. And I wanted to bring it and I just couldn't. Well, I really appreciate you taking so much time to come on our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. And I know you got to get on the air, but real quick before we before we wrap up here, you know, you're you're on such a incredible uh, network of CNBC. It's relied upon by so many people, you know, in the business world and, and quite frankly, just in general, if you want to have some great entertainment around the world of business. Uh, it's, it's the channel to watch. Tell me about some of your colleagues that you work with and, and kind of the fun that seems like you have on air, on set, you know, with some of the people that you, you work with. Yeah, I really, I mean, I have to say CNBC people are the best people in the business. They just, they're kind, they're funny, they're easygoing. I have such great teammates and my teammates make me better. And, and I'll, you know, course we correspondents will reach out to each other. And, you know, if we're doing a story that sort of dips a toe into somebody else's field, we're working collaboratively and we're, we're doing our best to set each other up for success. That's really great. I mean, I have great relationships with um, Brian Sullivan and Tyler Matheson and, Kelly and Sarah. And I, I mean, I, I could go on down the list. Joe Kernan and I go way, way back. Carl Quintanilla and I, we, you know, we, because I was at a sister network for so long and I used to be on CNBC doing news for CNBC, but from MSNBC and Joe and I used to get into it, you know, even years and years ago. So it's been really fun for me to come in and be a coworker and, and to sit with them. And I get a kick out of you know, I get a kick out of the kinds of stories we do. It's, we're not really doing too much like of the fun stuff right now because the markets are so volatile. And I think a lot of people, especially uh, retail investors are scared about what's coming. The uncertainty is real. And the job of CNBC right now is to make sense of what is happening, what's going to happen and help guide, help people have the information they need to make smart investment decisions um, for their money and their wealth. But ge genuinely, I just love the people that I work with and they are they know what they're talking about. They're smart and talented, but also just great humans. 
Well, I feel like we can go on for hours and I'm sure we'll see each other shortly at another you know, sports betting or casino industry conference. And I certainly look forward to that. And I look forward to seeing you on CNBC doing your thing. And you know, please feel free to reach out to, to us or to any of our portfolio companies that are really deep in the industry. And and then hopefully we can help you report on some of the amazing things. You that already do. Wayne, your, your knowledge, your connections and your insight have already been invaluable to me. And you're, you've helped educate me about some of the investment that goes on in ways that I, I really needed and it's been crucial and I appreciate what you do. Well, thank you and thank you for your time and it was awesome having you on our show. Have a great day.